You are all welcome to the last public lecture of the first day of the eighth European Congress of Mathematics. A uh, public lecture is hard to give, much harder than explaining your last theorem to a few colleagues. It needs depth, it needs width, it needs length, mastery in many related fields. We have someone who contributed to category theory, to homotopy theory, to knot theory, I'm going to forget, to computational algebraic topology, to theoretical computer science, to neuroscience, to cancer biology, to material science. I must confess, I panicked when I saw her CV. <laughs> She's been an author and an editor in all the uh, well-credited, most credited journals. She's a fellow of the American Mathematical Society, a distinguished speaker of the European Mathematical Society. She has been to all the mathematical institutes, uh, the best known uh, that you might know. She has dozen, a dozen of doctorants and many that are working right now. Herself has a PhD from uh, MIT. Uh, I mean, I, I have to choose. And when I look at the outreach, uh, I really had to choose. So I decided I will mention only one, uh, which is uh, the WISH project, where she has been the WISH Foundation, where she has been uh, vice president and member. And this is WISH is for uh, the promotion of women in science. Uh, I think I read at the beginning that she had four children. But after I saw the CV, I thought, no, maybe I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the first lecture uh, of the Congress today was the beat of math on the modeling of our heart. The last will be on our brain <laughs> through one of the most abstract uh, branch of mathematics, which is topology. So today I'm really proud to present Catherine Hess, Professor of Mathematics and Life Sciences in EPFL in the Ecole Polytechnique de Lausanne. And her talk will be topological, I, I looked at that, topological explorations in neuroscience. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very, very kind introduction, Betul. I'm going to now share my screen. I'm trying to make this work here. So, all right. So there we go. You're seeing the presentation mode and not the, the uh, I'll be seeing the correct mode. Let's put it that way. Okay, so as I said, thank you very, very much, Betul, for your very kind introduction. I'd also like to thank the organizers warmly for having invited me to give this lecture and having dealt so gracefully and efficiently with the organizational consequences of the COVID pandemic. I wish I could be with you in Potorosh this evening, both because of the exciting and rich mathematical program of the 8th ECM, and because Potorosh itself looks like a truly beautiful place to visit. In this lecture, I will take you on a mathematical mystery tour of the marvelous intricacy of the brain, during which you will see that applying the tools of that part of pure mathematics known as algebraic topology to neuroscientific data reveals fascinating complex structures in the brain, enabling us moreover to start to understand the role that these structures play in brain function. The work I will describe has been carried out in cooperation with the Blue Brain Project at EPFL, my home university. I'll tell you more soon about what the Blue Brain Project is, but we'll just point out by now that the beautiful visualizations that I have the privilege to use for this talk, like that in the background of this title slide, are due to the talented Blue Brain visualization team. I get no credit for that. For the first 20 years or so of my career, I devoted myself almost entirely to pure mathematics, more specifically to the field known as algebraic topology. Were this lecture to cover the research I didn't or still do in pure mathematics, algebraic topology, operads, homotopy theory, and so on, and to be a blackboard rather than a Zoom lecture, then the board might look much like this after 10 minutes or so, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Instead, I will focus on explaining how topology enables us to discern meaningful patterns in the incredibly intricate network of neurons, sometimes called nerve cells, of which the brain is composed, 
along with a range of other types of supporting cells, the astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and microglia, not to mention the highly complex network of blood vessels that provide oxygen and nutrients to the neurons by the intermediary of the astrocytes. This visualization provides only a small hint of the true complexity of the brain, as the actual density of neurons and connections among them is much higher than depicted here. And we see neither the supporting cells nor the blood vessels. Even in this simplified illustration, the neurons form a dense thicket with multiple connections among them, which seems challenging to characterize or describe in an easily intelligible manner, not to mention describing how the neurons actually process and transmit information. To avoid being overwhelmed by the complexity of the fully detailed network, we will apply a trick familiar to all mathematicians, known sometimes as dimensionality reduction. We will choose to focus on only certain key elements of the networks, obtaining thus a highly simplified representation of the full structure in the form of a graph or network consisting of points or nodes, each one representing a neuron, connected by line segments called edges, each one representing the existence of one or many connection points between two neurons. It's almost surprising just how much we can learn from such a simplified representation, as I will show you. You are all already familiar with the principles of representation and dimension reduction, since you almost certainly all use Google Maps or other online maps. Here we see a satellite map of Porto Roche, which I've never had the good fortune to visit, but hope to visit sometime soon. To navigate in a city one doesn't know, for example, to find the way from the Hotel Histrion, which you see on the sort of on the coast there, to the Casino Rivera. We don't need to know the colors of the various buildings we pass along the way, or who lives in the apartments on the various floors of the buildings. We need to know when to turn left, when to turn right, and for how long we should continue in a straight line. In other words, we need only a simplified representation of all the glorious multidimensional complexity of the city. Indeed, it is even much easier to see how to get from Mahota Histrion to the Casino Rivera in this simplified representation. We will apply an analogous strategy to develop a simplified representation of brain structure and function, which will make it much easier to discern interesting and meaningful strategic patterns. But first, as promised at the beginning of the talk, I'll spend a moment now to explain to you what the Blue Brain Project is. Founded by Henry Markram at EPFL over 15 years ago, the goal of the Blue Brain Project is to develop detailed digital reconstructions of brain regions, or maybe even of entire brains. Markram's dream was to exploit all the data gathered in neuroscience labs over many decades in order to build a computer model of the brain that would function like an actual biological brain, taking into account as well principles of brain structure and function formulated by experimental neuroscientists over the many years they worked in laboratories. The complexity of the brain is such that even after decades of research by tens of thousands of neuroscientists, they've gathered only a very small fraction of all the data they would need in order to build a perfect model of the brain. So building the blue brain model required considerable intelligent extrapolation from known data. Such an extrapolation is possible since the brain is in fact highly structured and not randomly constructed, making it possible to make intelligent guesses about how to build a good model. As humans, we are probably most interested in building models of our own brains, but the scale of such a project is still out of reach. In particular, since the human brain has hundreds of billions of neurons and hundreds of trillions of synapses, the connection points between two neurons. The quantity of data involved is unimaginably vast spanning a wide range of scales from the level of individual molecules to that of entire brain regions. The Blue Brain Project thus chose to start by modeling parts of a rat brain instead. Since it is considerably smaller with hundreds of millions of neurons and hundreds of billions of synapses and presumably less complex than the human brain, 
Moreover, there is substantially more data available about the structure of rat brains, since rats are more commonly accepted experimental subjects than humans, particularly when it comes to sampling brain tissue and carrying out intrusive experiments. Before explaining how the Blue Brain team proceeded to build their models, let's start by learning a little bit of neuroscience, a bit about what neurons are and how they work to process and transmit information. A neuron consists of three main parts, the dendrites, which are tree-like structures that gather input from other neurons, start to process it, then transmit the signal further to the cell body, also called the soma, for further processing causing the membrane potential to rise, the, the potential on the membrane of the cell itself. When the potential hits a certain threshold, the soma may or may not emit an action potential, also called a spike, an electrical signal that travels down the axon until it meets the dendrites of other neurons in connection points that are called synapses, where the signal may or may not be transmitted from one neuron to the next. The top of the figure illustrates how a synapse functions via the release of neurotransmitters from what is called a bouton on the axon to a receptor called a spine on the dendrite. Of course, this is quite a simplified description of neuron structure and function. Indeed, true neuron structures look quite different from this cartoon. As we see in this beautiful visualization of a family of rat neurons called pyramidal cells, due to the roughly pyramidal shape of the soma or cell body. Here we see only the somas and dendrites of these neurons, which come in a surprisingly wide variety of shapes, sizes, and orientations. Lots of branches or few, oriented up or down or sideways, very tall or quite short. The brain is populated by an impressively diverse population of neurons, displaying a broad range of shapes and functions. Neuroscientists have shown that a neuron's shape influences its function considerably, so it's very important to take precise neuron shapes into account when modeling brain function. In this even more detailed visualization, we see the intricate ramifications of the axons and dendrites of two pyramidal neurons. The bright spots illustrate synapses where the axon of one neuron meets the dendrite of the other, transmitting information from one to the other, always in the same direction from axon to dendrite. As we see here, these two neurons share many synapses, which is quite typical for actual biological neurons. Indeed, since synapses are often unreliable in the sense that they release neurotransmitters in response to a signal descending the axon only with a certain probability, for a connection between two neurons to be reliable, it is essential for it to be formed of several synapses. One perhaps surprising fact is that it is entirely possible to have a connection from neuron A to neuron B and a connection from neuron B to neuron A, which we call a reciprocal connection. The existence of reciprocal connections substantially increases the complexity of the network of neurons. Here's one final visualization, which gives an even more realistic idea of the wild tangle of axons and dendrites of which a network of neurons is comprised, though still not as dense as actual brain tissue. This is something, but, this is something like what actual brain tissue looks like under an electron microscope. Considerable recent effort has been devoted to extremely painstaking analysis by electron microscopy of one millimeter, cubic millimeter samples of actual brain tissue, teasing out the actual locations of synapses, for example, producing many terabytes of data. Tracing out how neurons actually connect is a great challenge, in part because axons tend to be very long on the scale of the brain and are usually not constrained within these very small samples. I'll describe to you now the first major reconstruction by the Blue Brain Project, which my collaborators and I then analyzed using the tools of algebraic topology. In 2015, the Blue Brain team published a landmark paper in the journal Cell, in which they described the culmination of 10 years of effort, the reconstruction of a sort of core sample of the rat somatosensory cortex, consisting of roughly 31,000 neurons forming roughly 8 million connections, of which this visualization shows only about 1,000 neurons. 
the somatosensory cortex is that part of the brain responsible for the processing of input stimuli coming from the sense of touch. The colors in this visualization highlight the six layers of the columnar core sample with the top layer at the surface of the brain and the bottom layer deep in the gray matter. On the right side of the figure, we see sample neuron morphologies of either excitatory or inhibitory types. The excitatory cells, which are the pyramidal cells I mentioned earlier, and which make up roughly 80% of the cells in the reconstruction, live up to their name by amplifying the signal, whereas the inhibitory cells are there to make sure things don't get out of control. These core samples, called microcircuits, were constructed by applying an elaborate algorithm, which I will describe briefly on the next slides, to sets of biological input parameters obtained from individual rats. These parameters were acquired from five different rats, and one extra set of parameters was obtained by taking averages over the five rats. Since the reconstruction algorithm is stochastic, involving probabilistic choices, it produces somewhat different microcircuits each time it is run with the same input parameters. To take into account this variance, reflective of bi biological diversity, the Blue Brain team reconstructed seven microcircuits for each of the six sets of parameters, leading to a total of 42 reconstructed microcircuits. The reconstruction process starts with creating a diverse collection of neuron morphologies to populate the microcircuit, starting from the three-dimensional descriptions of actual biological neurons, painstakingly acquired in the lab, usually by PhD students or postdocs, spending hours peering at slices of brain tissue under a microscope. Since diversity of shape is important, and there are few 3D descriptions of certain neuron types, the team had to develop algorithms to generate reasonable digitally synthesized neurons, a process that we've been able to improve dramatically using topological tools. And I'll mention a bit about that towards the very end of this talk. The columnar structure of the microcircuit is then populated with neurons in a stochastic or random manner, taking into account biological constraints, such as which cell types are present in which layers and the densities of cells in each layer. The final step in building the structure of the microcircuit is to determine how the neurons connect to each other, which is a subtle process based on proximity of axons to dendrites and what is known about probabilities of connection between different neuron types. Since basing existence of connections only on proximity of axons to dendrites would lead to far too many synapses for the circuit to function properly, the final step in the process is to prune away excess synapses to obtain distributions matching those measured in laboratories. Of course, we're really interested in how the brain functions, not just in its architecture, no matter how beautifully intricate it may be. To enable the microcircuit to actually function, the Blue Brain team integrated into their reconstruction detailed models of neuron and synapse electrophysiology, of which there's also a tremendous diversity. The reconstruction also includes models of what are called thalamocortical fibers, which transmit stimuli from the thalamus, which is essentially the brain's dispatching center, to the cortex for processing. In this way, by gluing together a number of these microcircuits, it's possible to simulate the reaction of a slice of virtual brain tissue to incoming stimulus. Even when left to itself, without any incoming stimulus, a neuron in a network will still occasionally randomly spike. Such spiking is called spontaneous firing, which can even be quite prolific depending on various electrophysiological parameters. The existence of spontaneous firing is thought to be important to ensure that the brain is ready at any time to react to an incoming stimulus, rather than needing to be awakened when a stimulus arrives. Since completing the original 42 microcircuits, the Blue Brain Project has gone on to reconstruct detailed models of the entire rat somatosensory cortex, consisting of some 4 million neurons, and participate in the elaboration of a detailed model of hippocampus, that part of the brain that's responsible for the memories and geographical location, in addition to developing somewhat less detailed models of the entire mouse neocortex. But why? Why go to the trouble and considerable expense on the order of 100 million euros of building these microcircuits? The algorithm for reconstructing the microcircuit takes into account numerous local constraints on its structure, such as probabilities for forming connections between neurons based on their types and their proximity, 
It is fascinating then to see what global overall structure and function emerges from these local constraints, and then to try to understand why it emerges. One remarkable example concerns the coordination or lack thereof in the firing behavior of the neurons in the microcircuit as a function of the concentration of calcium in the fluid in which the brain bathes, the cerebrospinal fluid, which is one of the parameters that can be tuned when simulating activity in the microcircuit. When the calcium concentration is low, the neurons fire spontaneously in a random, totally uncoordinated way. While they tend all to spontaneously fire together, when the calcium concentration is high, somewhat like what happens during an epileptic fit. Neither mode is ideal for being receptive to input stimuli, but there is a sweet spot in the calcium concentration at which a spontaneous firing is an ideal blend of randomness and coordination. This global behavior of the microcircuit was not built into the reconstruction, but rather emerged once all of the building blocks were put into place. In the medium term, it is possible to dream of using such reconstructions to study various neurological disorders, such as Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, using digital reconstructions that are modified to take into account the deformations and deficiencies typical of these disorders. For example, some disorders lead to shortening of neuronal branches, while others lead to less branching in neurons. Using the blue brain reconstruction method, we can build microcircuits from these deformed neurons and study the differences in structure and function which we can show have shown can be quite considerable. Similarly, it should be possible to do proof of concept testing for neuroprostheses, such as those improving the audition of people who are hard of hearing on such digital reconstructions. In the long run, one can hope that recourse to digital reconstructions should enable us to reduce the need for animal testing. For example, in the case of pharmaceuticals being developed for brain disorders. One could, for example, simulate the change in electrical activity in the brain in response to the addition of molecules of a possible new drug to see in great detail on both the neuronal and network levels what the effect might be. I'll explain now how topology helped us to detect structures in the microcircuit that play an important role in both structure and function. As we shall see, it turns out that topology is an excellent mathematical filter through which to look in order to discern the order and organization in the brain structure and function. It is in some sense the next natural step after graph theory, which has already proved quite useful in analyzing the network of neurons. But what is topology? This area of mathematics is related to both geometry and algebra, but not as well known even to the well-educated general public, as it is usually not taught in schools. This word cloud illustrates a number of the important concepts within topology, as well as its close cousins. I'll take a moment now to explain to you what topology is and why one might expect it to be useful in neuroscience. Topology is the mathematics of classifying shapes up to continuous deformation, as in the infamous transformation of a coffee cup into a donut and vice versa, leading to endless jokes about topologists trying to drink coffee out of a donut. The animation here shows how one could deform a coffee cup into a donut and back again, if both were made of clay or rubber, without cutting or pasting. The essential common point between the donut and the coffee cup is the existence of a hole, the center of the donut and the handle of the cup, which cannot vanish during such a continuous deformation. The topology is interested in what properties of shapes remain the same or invariant under such continuous deformations. Topology is also the sort of mathematics designed to characterize and probe types of connectivity within shapes, such as this directed network pictured here. Not only can we ask the question, can I get from point A to point B, but I can also ask in how many ways can I get from point A to point B? And what are the relationships between the different ways of getting from A to B? We can see in this directed graph, for example, many ways of following the arrows from any node of the network to any other node. How can we characterize the relationships between these different paths? Topology provides us with the tools to do so. And this is obviously highly relevant if we're interested in considering directed networks of neurons. 
Topology also provides an appropriate mathematical language in which to formulate conjectures and statements about emergence of global structure from local constraints, which is exactly the sort of problem we're interested in with the microcircuit. It also provides us tools to prove formally the emergence of such structure. The famous Möbius strip, pictured in the right-hand corner here, provides an example of such a global structure driven by local constraints. Since one can describe, describe the Möbius strip in terms of line segments associated at each point of the circle, which is then glued together according to local constraints that build in the famous twist that leads a Möbius strip to have only one side, unlike a cylinder. To analyze the blue brain microcircuits, we chose to focus only on the underlying directed graph or network in which each node represents a neuron of any type independent of shape or electrophysiology. And each line segment equipped with an arrow called a directed edge rep represents a connection consisting of any number of synapses from one neuron to another. So we've really dramatically reduced the information that we're taking into account. Recall that information or signals flow only one way through synapses from axon to dendrite, so that each edge has a well-defined sense of direction. As mentioned before, it is entirely possible to have reciprocal connections from neuron A to neuron B, and from neuron B to neuron A, as in the illustration shown here, we have a number of reciprocal connections. So how can we use the tools and language of topology to describe in a concise, intelligible, and meaningful manner the structure of a directed network with 31,000 nodes and 8 million directed edges in a way that will give us insight into how it functions? Even in the case of the much smaller network depicted here, it's not obvious how to start. I'll explain now a general method for using topology to analyze networks, which is applicable in many different contexts. Then we'll show the results we obtained when applying this particular method to the blue brain microcircuits in particular. To begin the analysis, we choose a collection of small subnetworks that are relevant in our context and that we call our significant subnetworks. In the case of the microcircuits, we choose as our significant subnetworks small, all to all connected, feed forward networks called directed simplices. We focused on these feed forward pieces since they should play a role in coordinating signal propagation. In other contexts, other collections of subnetworks may be more relevant to consider. And even in the context of neuroscience, one can argue for considering other collections of subnetworks. I show here only directed simplices with up to four nodes, but the obvious pattern continues for any number of nodes. We say that a directed simplex with n nodes is of dimension n minus one, as one node gives a zero dimensional point, two nodes determine a one dimensional line segment, three nodes determine a two dimensional triangle, and four nodes determine a three dimensional tetrahedron, etc. Note that as n increases, the directed n simplex provides an increasingly reliable structure for signal transmission from the source node, the node from which all arrows point out, to the sync node, the node towards which all arrows point. One can lose larger numbers of connections and still ensure the signal can get through. Note also that if I remove a node and all of its associated edges from an n simplex, I obtain an n minus one simplex called a face of the n simplex. For example, if I remove the bottom node and its associated edges from the two simplex here, then I obtain one directed edge as a one simplex that is one of the three faces of the two simplex. Similarly, if I remove the center node and all of its associated edges from the three simplex depicted here, then I get a two simplex, which is one of the four faces of the three simplex. To obtain local combinatorial information about the network, one can simply count and record the numbers of significant subnetworks of different types one finds within the huge network. This can already provide considerable insight into the network structure. Often more revealing, but usually computationally considerably more complex to obtain is a global information that is revealed by determining how the various significant subnetworks overlap in the larger network. I'll provide an illustration in a moment of the sort of overlap we consider and of the information it provides. But first, 
Let's take a look at the local information provided simply by counting directed simplices, those little feed forward networks within the microcircuit. The blue curve in this figure describes the local combinatorial structure of the blue brain microcircuit. For each simplex dimension, we plot the number of copies of the directed simplex of that dimension that we find in the microcircuit. There are, for example, some 75 million two simplices, roughly 60 million three simplices, a bit fewer than 10 million four simplices. And even though we can't see it in this plot for reasons of scale, considerable numbers of five, six, and seven dimensional simplices. There are just thus numerous families of neurons, also all connected in a feed forward manner within the microcircuit, up to eight neurons, also all connected in a feed forward manner. Numbers like this don't mean much unless one compares them with controls or null models, which is what the other two curves represent. The green curve describes the number of directed simplices one finds in a random Erdős-Rényi directed network with the same number of nodes and the same average connection probability as the blue brain microcircuit, which is to say 0.8%. Given any two nodes, the probability of existence of the connection between them is 0.8%. So in this erdős renyi model, given any pair of nodes, we add a directed edge from one to the other with a probability of 0.8%. There are many fewer two and three simplices in this random network than in the blue brain microcircuit and absolutely no simplices of higher dimension. We can conclude that blue brain microcircuit is far from random in this sense, not an entirely surprising result and reassuring to the Swiss public that spent roughly 100 million euros on building a circuit. The yellow curve provides us with a more fair comparison since it counts directed simplices in a simplified biological model, which doesn't take into account precise neuron morphologies, for example. Even there, we see that the blue brain microcircuit exhibits considerably more complex structure and organization than this simplified biological model. Laboratory experiments have proved the existence of high dimensional simplices in actual rat neocortical tissue. If anything, this reconstruction probably underestimates the true extent of structural organization in biological circuits. Our motivation for choosing directed simplices, these small all to all connected feed forward networks was based on our intuition that directed simplices should play a role in coordinating and reinforcing signal transmission. This plot lends credence to a hypothesis. Let me explain. Considering all connected pairs of neurons in the microcircuit, we measured the degree of correlation in their firing patterns during spontaneous activity in the network. The dotted horizontal line in the plot, roughly 0.3, indicates the average correlation in firing patterns over all connected pairs of neurons. We then checked to see whether this correlation was related to the presence of directed simplices. For each connected pair of neurons, we determined the maximal dimension of a directed simplex to which that connection belongs. This is the value on the x-axis in the figure shown here. On the y-axis, we plot the average correlation in firing patterns. The color of the curve depends on what condition, if any, we put on the location of the connected pair within the simplex. For example, the red curve counts only those connections between the la second to last and last neurons in a simplex, while the blue curve considers them all without condition on the exact position of the connection. We observe that, the greater the maximal dimension of the directed simplex to which a connection belongs, the greater the correlation in firing behavior of the neurons, indicating that directed simplices do indeed serve to coordinate signal transmission. Moreover, if a connection is not part of any larger directed simplex, the case of dimension one on the x-axis here, then the correlation in the firing behavior of the neurons is only half of the average across the whole network. To exhibit coordinated firing behavior, the connected neurons need to be part of a bigger structure. It's not enough for them to be connected to each other. Let's return now to the idea of global structure in a network and how we can describe it. Recall that I mentioned the idea of considering overlaps between significant subnetworks within the much larger directed graph. 
to see what more complex structures these building basic building blocks may create through such overlaps. We should think of a child with a set of wooden building blocks, carefully building a castle, of which important distinguishing features would be, for example, windows and rooms. We might be interested in describing the castle by counting how many windows it has and how many rooms it has, for example. In the case of the significant subnetworks that we're considering today, these directed simplices, the sorts of complex structures we particularly care about are cavities or holes in the structure, like windows and rooms, built of overlapping simplices, such as the window or one cavity or loop in this illustration, built from four one simplices that overlap on their nodes. Here's an example of how one can build a room, or we could call a two cavity, from eight two simplices that overlap along their edges, which are themselves one simplices. One can build analogous, but much harder to visualize, higher dimensional cavities from n simplices that overlap along their faces, which are themselves n minus one simplices. Building such cavities is a highly non-random thing to do, and so the existence of such cavities is a true indication of complexity of organization and structure. Everything is now in place for me to present to you what I consider to be one of the most striking structural results we obtained when studying the Blue Brain microcircuit. As I mentioned earlier, the Blue Brain team actually built 42 microcircuits, seven for each of the six sets of input parameters, five of which were obtained from individual rats, and one of which was the average of the other five. Because of the randomness inherent in the reconstruction algorithm, one might wonder how similar the seven reconstructions based on the same parameter set are, and how different reconstructions arising from different parameter sets are. It turns out that topology provides a beautiful answer to this question as summarized in this figure. Each dot in this figure corresponds to one of the 42 microcircuits. The dots are colored as a function of the input parameter set, dark blue for rat number one, orange for rat number two, et cetera. The coordinates of each dot are the number of two cavities and the number of three cavities in the directed network underlying the particular microcircuit. Observe that the data cluster perfectly Microcircuits coming from the same parameter set are close to each other, while those coming from different parameter sets are far apart. Only the cluster arising from the average parameter set overlaps a bit with that of one of the rats, which is perhaps not too surprising. It's almost magical that these topological measures of the microcircuit structure reflect so well the biological differences described by the input parameters. Another strong indication that topological tools truly are biologically relevant in neuroscience. So far, I've talked almost exclusively about the structure of the microcircuit. What about its function? As this movie of simulated activity in the microcircuit shows, let me get the movie going, there we go. The wave of activity spreading through the network creates a beautiful evolving tapestry, which looks even more difficult to characterize than the structure of the network itself. It is natural to ask whether, and if so, how, the topology of the underlying structure shapes the activity in the network, and whether we can use similar topological tools to analyze this activity. It turns out that we can, as follows. Given a recording of neural activity in the microcircuit, we divide the recording into time steps of biologically meaningful length, roughly 10 milliseconds. Within each time step, we determine which connections, which directed edges were active in that time. In other words, which edges correspond to pairs of neurons where you had one neuron that fired, and then the neuron to which it was connected fired shortly thereafter. We can consider then that perhaps the first neuron caused the second to fire, and we consider the edge to be active. In this visualization, each bright dot corresponds to a neuron, and the line segments correspond to active edges between them in one particular time step, 
In each time step, we apply our topological tools to the subnetwork consisting of the edges that are active at that time. Each time bin thus gives rise to, an asso to associated counts of numbers of simplices and cavities of various dimensions. We then study the evolution of these counts through time, giving rise to striking plots such as this, which my team and I most undignifiedly call the swoosh, and which represents in some sense a topological signature of information processing in the microcircuit. Each curve in this figure corresponds to the activity in the microcircuit in response to one of three types of stimuli injected into the circuit. The pink being the strongest stimulus and the blue the weakest of the three. In each case, the same pattern arises though with varying amplitudes. Each point in one of the curves has as coordinates the number of one cavities and the number of three cavities in the active subnetwork at a certain time. As time advances, the changing network activity leads us to loop around the curve in a counterclockwise fashion. In other words, as the network reacts to an input stimulus, the active subnetwork becomes increasingly complex, building more and more one cavities at first, then more and more three cavities until suddenly it all fades away. Like a sandcastle built by children at the beach, which grows increasingly elaborate until suddenly it's washed away by a wave. The curves presented here arose from measurements made in the microcircuit with built from the average parameters. Those arising from microcircuits of the five individual rats look similar, though with varying amplitudes and a shifted center of mass, if you will, of these curves. To conclude this lecture, I'll present briefly another rather different application of topology to neuroscience to the classification of neurons based on their morphologies or shapes. Since a neuron's morphology strongly influences its function, classification of neurons by their shapes helps us to understand and to predict their behavior. Given two neurons, like the two pyramidal cells represented here, with their basal dendrites in red and so-called apical dendrites in purple, how can we characterize the differences and similarities between their shapes. Applying the methods of the, air, of the subject known as topological data analysis, we can associate to each neuron a sort of topological signature in the form of a heat map, which indicates the lower two squares in this illustration. The red color indicates the presence of many branches and the blue color, the absence of branches. The neuron on the left has numerous dendrites near the soma and a good sized tuft of branches further out, unlike the neuron on the right, which has many dendrites near the soma and no real tuft. The differences between the two neurons are thus clearly highlighted, as illustrated by the top square, which is given by taking the difference between the two lower squares, so subtracting one from the other. The process applied here involves breaking the neuronal tree into its branches in a carefully ordered way, keeping track of the start and end points of each branch, their distance from the soma, which are recorded as xy coordinates of points in the plane. One then takes these xy coordinates in the plane and from that creates this heat map. In more recent work, we've reversed engineered this process of associating topological signatures to neuron morphologies, designing an algorithm to synthesize new neuron morphologies from topological signatures of biological neurons, giving us a more principled way of populating digital reconstructions with a wider diversity of realistic synthesized neuron morphologies. Using this topological signature, we also provided a complete objective classification of all the pyramidal neurons in the rat brain, confirming to a large extent previous subjective experience-based classifications carried out by neuroscientists, while also clarifying certain ambiguities in the, the subjective classification. It's not possible to carry out such a complex project without the help of a great team of people with a wide range of competences, ranging from neuroscience to data science, to topology, to computer science, and really 
I would like to express my appreciation to the many members of, that I've had the privilege to work with over the last six or seven years on developing these projects, carrying out these experiments, and writing these papers together. To conclude this presentation, I share with you a view from my fun favorite regions in Switzerland, and thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to answering your questions.